you so much, Kelly. Um, it's so nice to have you all here. Welcome to this really unique and, and special site in Missoula. Um, so my name is Caroline Stevens and my wife, Katie Nelson, who's doing parking over there, mm -hmm. and I um, run this site for the city of Missoula. We um, are contiguous with the rest of the North Hills open space here um, on city-owned public lands. And a lot of the energy to preserve this site was generated by folks who we'll, we'll hear from tonight um, who are associated with, with Carrie. Um, and the history of this place um, is layered and complex. And um, what's most obvious to people are, are a lot of the buildings on site, the barn, the old moon cabin. They tell the story of um, settler history um, of homesteaders coming out west, um, being told that it rained a lot more than it did, <laughs> um, given free land in order to sort of take that land and make it part of the United States. And um, that was done through the Homestead Act. And so this, uh, this term we use, homestead, is a really a technical term. It's a legal term to describe this site. And the, the families who homesteaded here were the Moons um, from 1889 to 1894, and the Randolph family is starting in 1907 and on up until the 90s. Um, and these families tell the story of a lot of hardship and by today's standards, uh, uh, not a lot of material wealth and what we might describe today as um, a state of poverty. These people lived very close to the land, um, working the land to earn a living and also to provide for their families uh, what they needed. And uh, these families were able to weather the Great Depression because a lot of their resources came right from this land. Um, so we tell about those stories, those settler stories. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of this site is that these, these families built uh, many of these structures with reused materials and we are also, as you already saw, very, very close to the dump, which is growing bigger every year. And so we, we tell the story of material reuse and the crea creativity that it takes to live close to the land um, uh, on a, a thin dime, I should say. But of course, uh, history did not start in 1889. And for 14,000 years, the Salish and Kalispell <laughs> and many other tribes uh, traveled through this landscape and uh, conducted their seasonal rounds. Um, this space, this land is, is very adjacent to a traditional trail that was used by the Salish, Kalispell, and other peoples to travel to uh, cultural resources like um, Camas in what is now today Potomac, and up the upper Clark Fork and up the Black Red River uh, out to harvest bison. So. Um, we're trying to do a better job to tell the larger history that precedes um, the settler history, which is really just a very, very, more, very, very recent part of the site's history. My wife, Katie, and I have lived here since 2016, and, and we, as caretakers of the site, we know it, we've come to know it better over time. Uh, there's still so much to learn from this site, and um, what we, what strikes me most is how many people really enjoy being here and how many people have come through this landscape for really thousands of years. Um, and today, the people of Missoula um, seem to really enjoy coming here. And we have kids camps run by Parks and Rec. We have kids uh, film camps with the Roxy Theater, make horror films shot at broad daylight at noon, <laughs> and all sorts of fun community events. The Writers Collaborative comes up here, um, and of course, uh, our, our a more recent partnership since I think 2019 with Open Air, which has realized a dream of ours to bring artists to this site, to um, take the energy of this site and make work that reflects like the very complex and layered histories of this place, um, and the realities of living uh, in this land together as we do. And it's been such an exciting time this summer to welcome Carrie Rosenstein up here, and she's going to be introduced formally later, but um, I just want to say that um, we have, this is a very special time and, and a special experience tonight to witness somebody coming back to this place uh, 20 years hence, and we've just been reveling together as we sit at this site and like the circularity of time that is just the reality of living so seasonally, as Katie and I do um, as caretakers of the site and for me as farmer at the Peace Farm. So um, 
and it's it's just a really exciting time to, to bring Carrie back, and I'll let her tell you why that's so exciting. Um, but uh, we feel really grateful for Open Air for making this a possibility for us. Um, if you have more questions about the history of the site, I would really encourage you to talk to my wife, Katie. You can raise your hand. Uh, she interprets this site 95% of the time. Um, I do very little <laughs> caretaking on site, but I'm very happy to speak to the public. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to Carrie or to Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm not used to talking with a microphone, so tell me if you can or can't hear me. Okay. Um, thank you, Katie and Caroline, for having me here. Um, gosh, I'm going to be emotional. <laughs> um, yeah, and there's so many people I'm just really appreciative um, to um, see and to be here with. And yeah, this kind of meandering history, but um, <coughs> just really grateful to, to be here. So, and thank you to Open Air, to Kelly and Stoney and all the people who have really supported this experience. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So I will just say, I didn't really plan what's going to happen here. Um, I planned a bunch of components that I know I want to share and not really sure how this is going to go, so we're in this together. Um, and I don't know what you do like the night before you're going to take a trip or you have a deadline or um, are giving a presentation, but I go into like make something mode um, rather than planning. So I made these small books, um, which I think Katie has a few to share. Um, I really didn't want to have um, technology up here, so it was a way to share some old photos from 21 years ago, as well as um, some photos from the last couple weeks. So there's not enough for everybody. If we can just maybe like pass them around and circulate them, um, that would be great. Um, I just finished these like an hour ago. So, um, yeah. Okay, so I always just feel like it's nice to have something in my hand. So this is a way for you to have something um, in your hand and something that's really special. Can you hear me? Something that's really special about this place um, is the intimacy of this place and the invitation to touch things and um, to kind of have a personal experience. So that was part of... Um, my inclination to make a small book to share with you. Um, okay, so you can look at it while we're talking if you want. I'll maybe just say a few things about it. I'm kind of nervous, obviously. Um, but um, I'll just share, while I've been here the last couple weeks, um, I've been working on a large weaving, which is what's on the front. It's hanging in the trees over there, and we'll, um, there'll be an invitation to walk over <laughs> and see it um, when I'm done talking, or while I'm talking, you can get up and go. Um, and the first like handful of photos are from 21 years ago, July and August of 20, or 2002. Um, they're a mixture of photos from myself as well as Caitlin and Sarah DeSilvi, who um, are sisters who were uh, very integral to um, bringing this place into the city's care. And then there's a break here, and it goes into more of like photos from the last couple weeks. And there's a mix of some writings from Caitlin, as well as Caitlin and I's correspondence the last couple weeks. OK, that's all I'll say about that right now. Um, uh, well, a couple of things. One, having not really planned words, I'm going to read some other people's words. Um, and also, I thought. It was worthwhile sharing as I was driving up here, I was thinking about this, that um, because I didn't really prepare and plan, um, I didn't know what I was going to wear. Not that I want to draw attention to my words or to what I'm wearing, but I will just say, um, as I was uh, 10 minutes before leaving, and like, what am I going to wear? Um, I remembered I have this white linen skirt, which I've never worn, brand new, from a thrift store. Um, and it just seemed like today's the time because I've actually been weaving linen, and there's some notes of um, the Caitlin and I corresponding 21 years ago about a scrap of linen. So, um, also the shirt. If you know me from 21 years ago, you probably know the shirt. Um, it's barely holding together, and it kind of like merges those times. So, um, 
in my 10 minutes before scrambling out the door, it seemed to <laughs> make sense. Um, so I want to read um, part of an excerpt from an essay written by Caitlin to Sylvie. And Caitlin and Caroline, or Katie and Caroline, um, could share probably more accurately because I've been thinking a lot the last couple of weeks in my residency here, which there's a wall tent up in the orchard where I've been living um, these last few weeks. But I've been thinking a lot about memory and time and how abstract these concepts are. Um, and I don't know if anybody's with me on that, but like it's a funny thing. Um, and so in this time that I've been here, Sarah, who's a doctor in Vermont, and Caitlin, who's a professor in England um, now, uh, the three of us have been corresponding a lot the last few weeks and like calling in all these memories and all these stories and like trying to figure out time and we all have these different recollections of things. Um, I was up here for Sarah's labor and her child just turned 21 years old. Um, so it's kind of marking time in this weird way. Uh, so yeah, so my memory is a little um, interesting. But uh, so Caitlin, Caitlin was um, instrumental in acquiring the, the homestead after the Randolphs were here and became one of the first people in helping to steward this place uh, for the city. And she was actually up here doing a PhD um, about the homestead. Actually, she was doing a PhD in England and had did a, ma did a master's in Scotland. Um, but she had lived in Missoula for a long, long time. And she wanted to write about this place for her PhD. Um, and so yeah, so Caitlin was very involved here. How I met Caitlin was actually through her sister, Sarah, who when I first moved to Missoula in 1999, um, I worked at Parks and Rec and I worked at Bernice's Bakery. Um, Sarah also worked at Bernice's Bakery and we became quick family. Um, and so it was, and I was doing an MFA at the university uh, in painting and drawing. So I met Sarah, met Caitlin, Caitlin was doing this PhD. She wanted to have me up here as um, a friend, as a sister, as an artist, um, to see like how do we how do we make sense of place, uh, which is a question I'm always interested in as well. Uh, so that's a little bit of background, and I think I'm just gonna I want to read part of this essay that Caitlin wrote, and I don't know if it'll make any sense, but. Also, in the little book, um, in the back part is some correspondence between Caitlin and I over text messaging the last few weeks. And I mentioned this uh, essay in the text message that I told them I was up here doing an artist residency. I told them I felt called to be in the orchard. And Caitlin said, oh, let me send you this essay. It might be interesting. So I read, she wrote this a year and a half ago. I had no idea about this essay. She had no idea I was here. And it was like remarkably resonant and really kind of um, spoke to so much of my time here. So um, it's a bit abstract and obtuse. So um, yeah, I'll say that. Um, yeah, so again, it's written a year and a half ago. It was part of an um, invitation for her to contribute to a publication called Woven and Vegetal Fabric on Plant Becomings from 2022. She says um, in the author's note at the top of the article, um, I've since realized that the soul searching I was doing in this piece resonates with work of others who are also using the apple to imagine and invent new versions of self and of culture. The article's titled Becoming Apple. Start in the middle, the translucent chamber that holds the slick bitter seeds, the issue at hand, if the self the stable, coherent, singular self is partly what got us into this mess, then we'll need different versions of self to get us out the other side. And we can talk as much as we like about the need for permeable and interconnected subjectivities, but we will all experience this conversion individually, if at all. The only subjectivity I have to think with is this one. If I can understand something about how I assembled the self, where the parts came from, and how the metaphors work, I might understand how it can be refigured. In this essay, I take up the invitation to think about plants becoming human and humans becoming plant by thinking with one plant, the apple, 
and one human, me. A warning, the arc of the narrative is uneven, loosely hung around memories and moments when the Apple and I found ourselves sharing a story. At the end, there is no resolution, rather maybe dissolution, but let's begin. So I'm gonna bounce all around and I'm leaving out huge hunks of Caitlin's life and research, so again, I don't know if it'll make sense, but hopefully the excerpts are um, interesting enough. Some years later, I went west and lived in a ragged collective on the wrong side of the tracks in Missoula, Montana. We tended gardens of open pollinated vegetables and pressed cider with school children on, creaky, on a creaky wooden press. We kept worms along the railway fence and bees under the apple tree. In 1997, a Missoula friend tipped me off about an old orchard in the hills above town, heavy with apples ripe for picking. We had a deal with the Mormons this year to use their cannery to make gleaned apples into sauce for the food bank. I went up with a few others and found the orchard tucked into a swale below a sunburnt barn, the high and reckless branches laden with fruit. I later learned that Ray and Lula Moon planted the orchard of 75 grafted trees shortly after they established a claim to the 160-year-old parcel of land in 1889. The orchard was not only for sustenance, it was legally classed as an improvement, one of several that according to the terms of the 1862 Homestead Act would allow Ray and Lula to prove up on their claim after five years and gain the title to the property. In the same year the Homestead Act was adopted, the Atlantic Magazine published Henry David Thoreau's Wild Apples essay. She quotes, our Western emigrant is still marching steadily toward the setting sun with the seeds of the apple in his pocket, or perhaps a few young trees strapped to his load. At least a million apple trees are thus set further westward this year than any cultivated ones grew last year. Consider how the blossom week, like the Sabbath, is thus annually spreading over the prairies, for when man migrates, he carries with him not only his birds, quadrupeds, insects, vegetables, and his sword, but his orchard also. Before there was an orchard, there was a trail in those hills that the Salish, Kootenai, Ponderé, and Nez Perce people followed in their seasonal migrations. They would have paused in the swale to gather wild plums from the thicket along the creek. Before the plums and the people who ate them, there was a vast lake backed up behind a dam of ice. The swale was then a swampy inlet at the wavering waterline. The orchard is rooted in a soil of ancient sediment the sifted bodies of plants and animals layered over centuries to form a deep loam that sustains thirsty fruit trees in the otherwise arid and rocky hills. That place, the orchard, and the cluster of derelict sheds and dwellings in the hollow below it held me for a decade and eventually became the field site for my UK-based doctoral studies. Am I okay to keep going? Okay. Um, skipping around. How to defend the focus on self and story. This way. I have lived my adulthood against the background hum of climate and ecological collapse, the bass note accompaniment to rough decadal sections. My dirty and dedicated 20s in Montana, my 30s in a blur of beginnings, career and family, and bicontinental dwelling, my 40s spent writing about change as an intellectual and imaginative problem, not a practical or a political one. Accelerate through the COVID years and it's 2022, and I'm now 50 years old. Net zero by 2050 is the target, they say, but it's probably too late to hold us at a 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're on course for 2.7 degrees Celsius and two to three meters of sea level rise by the end of the century. In the wee hours, I worry, imagining the world my sons will inhabit. I know that when you slice it up objectively, my individual contribution to the slow motion disaster has been negligible but I can't help wondering how one reasonably alert person with a decent awareness of what was playing out ended up essentially complicit in the inertia and an inaction that defines those lost decades. During those years, I cultivated ways of being and doing that allowed me, for the most part, <coughs> to maintain a sense of myself as rooted and responsible, and the apple was part of that self-narrative. I tended my gardens and taught other people how to grow food. I mended and repaired what I could, shopped at the farmer's market, and sometimes rode my bike to work. I harvested the apples from the allotment tree every October and distributed the surplus to my neighbors. 
There was boom and, bo boom and bust, of course, so many transatlantic flights, but I told myself the pattern bent better towards, bent, bent towards better than nothing. Your grandchildren will gather the apples. Will they? I'm not so sure anymore. And I'm starting to wonder if the apple and its reassuring presence is part of the reason I have been able to pretend otherwise for so long. But if the apple fed the self's delusion, then maybe the apple can help refigure it. Does that make sense if I go backwards? <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, backwards. No, earlier. Um, okay. Earlier in the essay here. Um, and then the apple went odd. I'm not sure how to explain this, but it's important, so I will try. The tick started when I was about 18, in moments when I thought I had not been true to myself or had said something that I later regretted, it would come, unbidden, uttered under my breath. Apple, apple, apple. The mantra soon morphed into apples and oranges, apples and oranges, apples and oranges, and the index split became explicit. Bobbing to the surface after botched encounters invariably triggered when I sense myself in the world as not the self I can sustain. I've gone long spells with it dormant, but it always returns when the dissociation deepens. It's my late, not early, warning system. And even all these years later, it still comes. I've recently discovered it has a name. Paleolalia? The word comes from the Greek palin, meaning again, and lalia, meaning speech or to talk. It is a language disorder characterized by the involuntary repetition of syllables, words, or phrases. Self-consciousness as consciousness of self. So yes, apples and self. Self-soothing and self-correction indexed in authenticity. Okay. Almost done. At the end here, she writes, um, back in Montana, they've been doing their own prospecting. A few years ago, the homestead caretakers discovered a seedling apple tree growing down in the gully thicket among the wild plums. They invited researchers from the Western Agricultural Research Center to come check it out, and it was deemed worthy of propagation it's now possible to purchase the Lula Moon grafted on Bud 9 rootstock. Its description. The nearly yellow apple is splashed with stripes reminiscent of a Duchess of Oldenburg, but with the unique conical shape of the yellow bell flower. While not the sweetest apple in the bunch, this late ripening tree will please the palate with its almost pearl-like flavor when your summer apples have all gone to mush. The apple's heterozygous gift offers us different versions of self. Some versions more promising than the ones we've been using. I'm inclined to try this one. Of course, this self isn't new in any sense, but has been lying dormant, packed into the seed of me. I remember one summer, a quarter of a century ago, when a colony of wasps attacked our beehive, and for a few weeks I was possessed with the urge to protect the residents. I took to kneeling next to the hive and crushing each yellow jacketed invader with my fingertip as it went to enter. I didn't get stung by the bees or the wasps, my fierce concentration shielded me somehow and allowed me to briefly slip the hook of humanity. Uh, thanks for listening. You know, that was long. Um, I'm really moved by Caitlin talking about the relationship of Apple and self and thinking about a lot while well, I've been here. Um, I've been thinking a lot about time, like I said, and this sort of spiraling time circular time, as Caroline mentioned, um, and it like all compressing, and really thinking about the people that have been coming here for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, and that that's all somehow marked in the soil that's feeding these trees, making these apples that are nourishing us and kind of bringing new life, and so um, it feels really relevant to this chapter in my life. weaving, um, which is, uh, I'll just in short say, like, it's my old bed sheets. They've been through a lot of iterations, um, dyed by marigolds I grew and soaked in the Bitter River, and cut by hand, uh, and woven into a large blanket. So, I'm also just coming back to the beginning of this essay when Caitlin says, um, 
Singapore's work. And maybe I'll just say that. talking too much, so I, there's a few things, I feel like I was planning to say so much, but that feels like it just too much, my mouth is dry. Um, so I want to make space for there to be conversation and see what um, feels interesting to talk about. I also want to um, invite people to see the blanket, as well as to visit the wall tent. My loom is up there, um, and I also invited folks to bring clothing scraps. Um, if anyone did, if you didn't, no worries. If you did, great. Um, and it's all good and that they'll get, if you did, they'll get woven into um, kind of a community blanket that might live at the homestead or something like that. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll just stop talking and see if people want to talk about other things. I have a question. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm like romanticizing it, but so if you're up here just thinking of all those things and and weaving, do you go into like like how many hours do you do that, and do you go into like a meditative state? I mean, it makes sense that time feels comp compressed and all of that that whole experience. I'm sort of interested in the state of mind. Yeah. Um, thanks, Carrie. That's a good question, and that's. Um, something I've been really present with. So I feel like I've been up here um, mostly like early morning to to mid late afternoon. Leave for a few hours, go jump in the river, cool off, come back um, in the evening, and until it gets dark. Um, I kind of made this just sort of I don't know. I just made this decision at some point of the way to not put anything in my ears the entire time. So I've only been, the only input has really been the, the natural sounds and my mind. Um, and it has been just like this big um, moment of presence. And uh, I've been thinking about that maybe in some ways the weaving is just a way to keep my hands busy to get quiet. It's like I need to do this thing to actually be able to listen. And sometimes I just would like get hot or get uncomfortable and just lay on the ground um, in the trees. But maybe Katie and Caroline can say more. But I kind of just been in like very focused mode. Um, just like I'm doing this thing. And I would love it when they would um, or have like visited and we chat while I'm doing the thing. Um, but yeah, it's been a really quiet and introspective time. Hi. I remember you from many years ago, and you were more painting then, and maybe doing paper projects like this. When when has the weaving developed, and can you talk about that? Yeah, um, it's nice to see you. Thanks okay. for coming. Um, so my MFA was in painting and drawing, but if anybody was here, was at my like thesis show. It was all very sculptural and installation, and always like. of meaning to me and um, so it's also been always been a lot about transformation and there's a quote in the book that Caitlin pulled out of her journal where I say even if I don't have confidence in my work I have confidence in the material um, and I think that still holds that I trust the material to know what to do with it in some way um, so that's been like a long ongoing kind of always there process um, with my mom, um, who I speak with like once every couple months, um, and she reminded me that I wrote my college essay about SpaghettiOs, and I was like, oh, no, that's, that's ridiculous. And she's like, no, you got like, she's like, I told you it was ridiculous, but like all your English professors, and um, everybody said it was great, and the colleges asked you to write for the paper, and I was like, what did I say about SpaghettiOs? And she said I wrote the whole thing about like cycles and circularity, and um, seeing that in, in everything. 
really kind of moved to that I was thinking about that in high school. Um, and I think I see that in material, in place, in time, um, in relationships. As far as the weaving, um, gosh, I feel like, so I've been teach I was teaching at an arts college in Portland for a handful of years. Um, and I just started like having this dream that persistent and I felt um, uh, kind of, yeah, it just was a really persistent. So I actually um, had a really special opportunity to, to move to New Mexico for a year. Lived in northern New Mexico and studied with a fiber arts center and was learning some about the Navajo traditional weaving. Mm. I was like learning backstrap weaving, weaving um, and I just went on this deep dive and I kind of um, I don't want to like misuse the word, but like kind of obsessed. Uh, and I really, I don't even think of myself as a weaver. Um, I really think of it as drawing. And it's just another way of seeing and moving my hands and um, like touching essence in some way. So uh, there's, you know, there's real weavers out there. That's like a whole nother thing that I don't feel comfortable with. But yeah, so I think it's really integrated. Um, of seeing weaving as drawing in a kind of very interdisciplinary practice. That's a long answer. That wasn't even an answer. But, uh, yeah, so it's a mix and it's not all weaving. I do feel like maybe a lot of what has been shown publicly more recently is weaving because I feel like it's um, maybe more accessible than some of the Relationship with time, right? Well, you now? said that you have, yeah, you've been having new thoughts about time. Maybe it's related to circularity, maybe it's about, I don't know, yeah. depression, like you use those words. Yeah. Um, well, anyone who knows me knows I'm very non linear. So I think about time non linearly as well. Um, I don't know why this is what's coming to mind with your question, um, and I don't feel competent to fully. Um, explain this, but um, thinking about the um, Maladome Somme, who's an African um, elder, spiritual, brilliant person who's no longer living, but I recently heard a talk with him and he said, um, we all have bones and our bones know things. And so it's made me think a lot about um, like ancestry and our collective history and the kind of collective experience. Um, that expands way beyond time because it's part of our DNA and in our bones. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately and then being here and thinking about the history that's nourishing these trees. Um, and so all the life that is energetically in, in here is just this big time, big time and trying to um, maybe like consider myself on this bigger spectrum of time that this is just a small fleeting moment um, and to be present for this moment. I don't know. That's just something I've been thinking a lot when he says like our, we all have bones and our bones know things. I've been thinking like the soil knows things um, and has all, lots of bones. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I 
think about, I mean, I want to, I wish I had something more. Well, this isn't a question, and it might be too specific, but just thinking about your circular thing in time, and how you started weaving however long ago that was, that piece that you made that made itself, mm. when you were with Agnes, the picture, that, that's not weaving, but it seems like it's really kind of it. It was knitting, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's all the same to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can share about that piece. I feel like um, that was a sculpture I made in like 2004, I want to say. Um, but I made this sculpture called Thing That Becomes Itself. And um, I had spent some time in Bolivia and I would see all the people knitting there. So I wanted to learn. So I asked this um, kind of woman on the street who was knitting to, to teach me. And she said, sure. So she, she taught me how to kind of um, knit with these double pointed needles and um, she gave me this ball of like black alpaca yarn and she was like hey you can have this it's with my broken minimal Spanish um, this is what I understood of like you can have this yarn it's dirty yarn and she kept calling it dirty yarn um, and I was like oh it's so beautiful it's like all natural and I think she was saying it was dirty because it hadn't been cleaned and it had like hay and mud and stuff in it um, and so she gave me that that ball of yarn to take you know into my life and um, I always felt like that thing was so special I didn't know what to do with it I like what was the right thing to make with this one ball of dirty yarn um, and so I kept it and moved it around with me for years like many other special things um, and what I did so you know it was a ball of yarn like a string so I actually, with these double pointed needles, knit the string into a thicker string, like the wick of a candle. Um, and then I knit that thicker string into a thicker string, and that thicker string into a thicker string, as far as I could until it came back to actually, like, became sort of like a ball, um, what was left of it. And so, um, hence, thing that becomes itself. But it was like I had to touch every fiber of that thing over and over and over to build a relationship of like essence of the thing so that it could just be itself um, and I feel like that has has threaded into a lot of my work whether it is sculptural or um, or not but just like how do we how do we come to know a thing how do we come to know a place how do we know the essence of um, a thing and sometimes I think it's by uh, like touching every bit of it, whether it's with our hands or some other part of our um, being or understanding. So I tend to like belabor being with a thing and time goes by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the blanket feels very much like that. So these sheets are very storied, have a lot of history in them. Um, one of the things I'll say is that there's some white linen sheets. I always dreamed of having white linen sheets, and that somehow seemed like fancy to me. Um, and those um, those sheets became I'm like very filled with a lot of energy of time and history and um, dreams and as I say in the notes, like tears and just like a lot of life happens when we when we sleep. Um, and I felt like the sheets needed to like 